Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Starfield on a Starfield Sunday. I am your host, Bella Reed, and it is episode 12. We have some slates that we need to take to a person here in the Free Star Ranger complex, which looks great. I mean, the interior of this place is actually a year or two back, really I cool. Sure to drink with Ron Hope. But we that have a master decryptor that we need to drop some slates off to, so new deputy within these maze-like halls we will go find it's really him. an honor to be able to help out I do love the look of this place though Olga says I spend too much time at my terminal she's probably right I spend too much time at my terminal too but I work from home so what are you gonna do guys gotta make some cheddar some way hey there deputy way I hear it you've been keeping busy jumping from one side of the free star collective to the other how do you like the job so far <laughs> oh, it feels good out there to make a difference. Yeah, I mean, that's good to hear. So, what brings you by? Got a couple of those encrypted slates. Well, well, what do we have here? What for you? Well, this is new. Now he will ponder the great mystery hmm. of the universe. Very interesting indeed. Having two of these should make the job go a lot faster. Double the data and all. And off he goes to do his stuff, and we get a level up, which is really nice. Or would be really nice, I should say, if this game was more tailored to builds. So now what we need to do is go to the meeting room. Hey there, Deputy. And I actually kind of like this part hey of the Deputy. game right here, this Take particular scene. Grab a chair. We'll talk a little bit more about this, I hope, if I have some time. While you've been in the field, we've had more reports about farmers being threatened and attacked. Unfortunately, some didn't survive. That is very bad. It's worse. It's tragic. How's your investigation proceeding? Uh, well, it's going well. Once Alex cracks their encryption, we could learn a lot. That's assuming he finds something useful. Otherwise, you'll be no better off than when you started. How can you be so critical when you have done nothing to help? This is Freestar Ranger business. I'll thank you to stay out of it. Let's move on. She tried on. to have my back. I asked the other rangers to share their opinions of you. And there are some things I want to go over. We'll start with Ranger Callow in Hopetown. This is the part she that's kind of fun. grateful for your timely arrival. And impressed you had the guts to take on those pirates. Nia says you were respectful with Ron Hope and didn't push too hard. That shows me you were listening when I said to go easy on him. Well, I didn't like him much, but I did what I had to. Duty has to come before personal feelings. I'm glad you understand that. Let's continue. We've got a detailed report from Ranger Price about your recent visit to Neon. He said you took on a syndicate loan shark to help an informant. Yeah, well, the informant was innocent. I had help. And you were right to do so. Helping people is our most important duty, even when you're conducting an investigation. You got results, and that's what matters most. Price was impressed by that. Said you really took the initiative. Ranger McMillan praised what she called your uncommon bravery and dedication. She said you took on the Red Mile so you could get a meeting with Marco Graziani. Well, it wasn't that bad. It was the best option I had at the time. Putting the lives of others ahead of our own comes with the job. I'm sure it was a tough call, but I think it was the right one. So what happened with Marco? I doubt he gave you that slate out of the kindness of his heart. It came to violence. You can guess how it ended. Too bad. I was really hoping he'd cooperate. Guess the threat of going back to prison was just too much He's for He's a thug. Him. What about Maya Cruz? Her loyalty to Hull and the 1st Cavalry was stronger than most. She didn't have much time left. But she wanted to end things on her term. I guess I'd want the same thing if I were in her place. Excuse me, Marshal? Not now, Alex. We're in a meeting here. 
I know, but this is important. I've done it. I've cracked the encryption on the slates. Now, I don't know exactly where the first are headquartered, but there are references to a place called the Factory. The Factory? That was our nickname for the main facility where the mechs were manufactured. Under the terms of the peace treaty, they shut all the mech factories down right after the war. But they didn't destroy them. At least not all. It's a pretty neat little bit of world building here. If the first is there, make sure none of the... Yeah, I'll go and check it out. The facility was on Arcturus too. It could be a dead end, but if it's not, then you'd better be ready for a fight. If you have questions before you head out, ask the marshal. So I like this part of the game, this particular scene in the conference room. I like it a lot because Bethesda has traditionally had a really bad track record with NPCs in their games reacting to the deeds that the character performs. And Starfield is really no different. It still has a really big problem with that. This one little scene is the bright spot in the whole game where NPCs react to what you did. And frankly, Bethesda needs to do way more of that. Uh, that would that would up the immersion of their worlds by by a factor of tenfold if they would just have more NPCs and companions and everybody peace. reacting to the things that you've done in the world to more or less reacting to your reputation. Um, it's one of those things that just feels a little bit lacking in this game. So the next thing I want to talk about is the fact that all of my voiceover for this whole entire episode actually did not get recorded as I was doing the episode. Here's Emerson. Everyone needs supplies. I'll say right up front that if you're short on credits, I can't help you. Here, browse to your heart's content. It's hard for me not to see the face of the character that he voices in Fallout 4. You meet him when you meet Paladin Dan's. And he's very gruff towards you and doesn't like you. He plays that character. Anyway, we're going to sell some stuff here. But the bigger point is I had recorded this whole entire episode and apparently the button on my microphone had been switched off and I did not notice it. Which is really lame because I have OBS right here in the next window and I can see the I can see the line going up and down when I'm speaking. So I should have been able to pay attention and know that it's not recording. But it didn't record. So we are going to leave Aquila City. And at this exact moment as I'm recording the voiceover in post-production, I have Welcome no idea where we're going. I know that what I tried to do here was I was thinking about doing some ship modification on the, on the ship that you're given to start the game with the Frontier. But the fact is that it's really a waste of money to do that. So I eventually back out of here and don't do that. Also, the other thing is you want to make sure you have Vasco assigned to your ship because of his bonuses to shields and uh, everybody else getting assigned in the proper order. Sam's the one guy who I don't mind because I don't need the extra piloting skill. So Andreja and I will take off now to the next particular location. I can't even remember what quest I'm doing at this point in the game. So this will be interesting. I'm just as in the dark as the rest of you. Greetings, Captain. <sighs> Whew, always a satisfying moment to return Sarah to your ship. Sarah is over here doing Bethesda things to the table. We have to go in here and make sure that we're not overly encumbered, which is hard to do on the frontier because it does not have a lot of room. And there are a lot of things that you pick up early on that you don't necessarily need. So... Resources are really heavy and they are a major source of weight on your person. We like to be able to make runs to Aquila to I'm sell listening. things, weapons, all that jazz. Spacesuits, helmets, get rid of all that stuff. Escape trajectory plotted. And we're underway. Hell of a view from here. 
Yes, but it's the same view every time, Sarah. It's always just outside the planet. Just outside of deep orbit. The space portion of the game basically takes place in a fishbowl. It's this tiny little area of space just outside of a planet. And that is the part that just kills Navigational me. Navigational feedback checks out. We're in the right place. And this is why I wanted to do a little bit of work on the ship, but ultimately did not. Uh, you do have to fight the people here. Not too late to run, scab. So with the frontier, you touch that grab drive. really want to get those shields down so you can start shooting the missiles because they're so much more effective. Shields down to 25%. Vasco, get on that. Now if you can just maintain the lock. And the recharge on the missiles is not great, so. Enemy's grab drive disabled. And here comes the second group of them. There's a level 20 ship there, and it's going to rock us. I'm of the mind to take out the bigger ships first, if you can, because I assume the smaller ships have less potent weapons. And since they're basically going to get a free shot at you while you're focusing on the one guy, he's got some massive weapons, so the last thing you want to do is have him facing us. But now we're severely damaged. You can press the O key to start repairing if you have ship repair parts. That's the big thing. You gotta have those. I'm surprised the user interface doesn't say there. Well, I'm not surprised because this is one of the one of the worst UIs in the game. This is one of the worst UIs I've ever seen in a video game is Starfield's UI. It's just awful. And it would be really nice if in that shield portion in the bottom right, it would tell you how many repair parts you have. So you'd know. This thing, it's like stay in its wake so you can try to get the missiles off. Their craft drive is crippled. They're not, they lost shield. Hit them Yeah, but now. I don't have any missiles ready. That's on the top left of this big circle. You can see it has a recharge. There we go. It recharges now. Fire. Be a good time to fire. There, colors fade. Fire. <laughs> what are you waiting for? And now we get the third group of the ships and we're really hurt, so. This is no point out. Got some repair done. It is, because now he's going to plow me. Target's grab drive has been knocked offline. Get on this guy. And our grab drive is toast. Another day, another kill. Repair those shields, somebody. Someone get her done. Trying to get it down here, I think, so I can use the missile at last. We have disabled their shield. Enemy's grab drive has been disabled. Level 14, so that was. Grab jump ready and at your command, Captain. That was three different waves of ships there. That was useful. The nice part about this is getting ship repair parts from looting these guys. 
when they have them. They don't always have them. And the thing is, I like to clear the map in space, this little fishbowl area that I talk about. I like to clear it of the... I don't like to leave things floating around. So you end up picking a bunch of stuff like that, like the seminal wafers and things. A bunch of things that are really heavy. And unless you're going to use them for a specific crafting purpose, they're just taking up space in your cargo container. So the, the real way to do this, the efficient way to do this, is to be very discerning about picking it up. Like nuclear fuel rod and positron batteries, I leave that behind because I'm no sense in picking that up. But it does, like create this weird itch with a uh, this really really weird itch this OCD itch it's like no I can't I can't leave that there <laughs> Good to go for I was said in one of my other posts on Twitter I think or a video that, that I did about this game that it really feels like nobody from Bethesda and there's not one single person working at Bethesda who has OCD because if they did, if they had anybody there working like that, they'd be playing this game going, Todd, you gotta fix this. You can't leave it like this. Yeah, make sure you get the rest so you get that bonus. Come on. There are worlds to conquer. Andresia. The Free Star Mech Factory, though. Every world with living things is a treasure. So, for as much griping as I do about this game, and certainly there's been a lot of griping from me on Twitter and a lot of you have probably seen the video by now about me talking about Elder Scrolls 6 and what Bethesda has to do with this yes you need me what have you got for me give her whatever we can here um this mech factory is one of the cooler parts of the game I like it quite a bit want to make sure she's got a grenade if there's anything you need so she can I am toss happy those to share. around and then what was I going to give her for a weapon? Oh, I was thinking about giving her the Ash to tame her. Because she, she will do a lot of damage with that. But I think it's actually better to just give her a laser rifle. And her specialty is in, what is it? Plasma plasma rifles or pulse rifles or whatever they're called. That The array of weaponry in this game is pretty mm -hmm. thin. Goodbye. I was watching another video from somebody day, pointing Captain. that out, and I was pretty surprised myself that there weren't more non-ballistic weapon types in the game. You can see, this is why you want to have your scanner up, is so that you can see the mines. I couldn't get to that one, so I got level up. It... It's baffling to me that, for instance, the game has so few different weapon types, especially for a space game set 300 years in the future. There's only a couple of laser rifles and a couple of pulse weapons. And yet there are like 800 different kinds of aid items. Whoever laid claim to this place seems to be long gone. Like, in my opinion, there really only needed to be one item one aid item for each kind of thing that can go wrong. So this entire quest right here is very reminiscent of going after a character in Fallout 4, what's his Kellogg. This very much reminds me of the Kellogg quest, and it's set up like the Kellogg quest. You have to infiltrate Fort Hagen in Fallout 4, and the whole time that you're progressing through the fort, Kellogg is talking to you over the loudspeaker. And so they basically took that blueprint for a quest, because it is a fun adventure in Fallout 4, and they took it and they implemented it here, so I can't blame them for reusing things that were good good ideas that were good that's what it is but I was watching another video where a person was pointing out the way that this this story could have gone down a little bit differently and it would have been a little bit more rewarding um, because what's going on here is Paxton Hall is upset 
because they were fighting the UC and they were about to win and then the Freestar Ranger Collective leadership decided that it was better to call a truce. And that's why you have the faction set up in the game the way you do here at the very beginning. This is for you! So Hull is mad. And as this one person in this video was pointing out, and I can't remember who to credit it now because I've been watching a number of these videos where people are doing what I'm doing, which is putting down all our thoughts on Starfield now that we finished playing it. Take your best shot. As he was we pointing out, it there. would have been really cool if <laughs> the final confrontation would have taken place in Aquila City with this Paxton Hull person coming there to try to do a hostile takeover because he wants to go to war with the UC. He wants to go back to the war with them and finish them off or, or get revenge for all his soldiers who fell because his leadership decided to call a truce. So there were ways to, to really expand upon this idea that here is this ex-military Freestar guy who's very pissed off that that he didn't get to finish the job. And instead he's sitting here in this isolated mech factory all by himself, just kind of holed up there so that they can do the Kellogg quest line with him. It's still fun though, because the best part of this game, in my opinion, is outside of the shipbuilding is, is just the combat. And that's even with combat, That's this isn't great combat, by the way. It's like somebody was saying, it's a pretty typical cover shooter. Um, the the fun of Fallout 4 for a lot of people was VATS. I never really got into using VATS in Fallout 4 until my most recent playthrough. And you the reason me. for that is because I love to play in survival mode in Fallout 4. It's a game that really lends itself well to a survival mode. Unfortunately, the default survival mode in Fallout 4 stinks. It's super stinky. But there's a mod that allows you to adjust all the parameters for survival mode, which is really cool. So you can make it, you can make it far more bearable and yet still get the survival mechanics that you want, like needing to eat and sleep and rest and, and not Always fast travel checking. and all that stuff. I don't stuff. know what you might find in their pockets. Did you need something? I keep and here's this thing that the game yes? does where if you engage someone walking while you're you want to talk to them and they're walking they keep walking I'm really hoping Bethesda patches that but anyway the point is back to Fallout 4 and it's survival mode as I figure out what the heck I'm going to give her here I think I'm going to take away her oh no I'm giving her a round of that so maybe I want her to blow some stuff up but with Fallout 4 since I play in survival mode, there's actually, there's actually a bug where right. uh, due to the way buffs work on Fallout 4, you can freeze the game if you try to use VATS. It's called the VATS freeze glitch. Fortunately, someone finally invented a mod that patches it and fixes it. So the last time I played Fallout, I put it in survival mode like normal and I applied that patch and I was able to make a VATS build instead. I'm a man of action. I've got no use for lies. So when I tell you that you're being manipulated, you know I'm telling the truth. You think the Council of Governors really cares about anything but themselves? They're greedy and corrupt. You're a tool in the hands of the unworthy, just like I once was. I was loyal. I followed orders, and I led good men and women to their deaths. I'll carry the stain of that dishonor to my grave. The animations here for when enemies get hit by bullets is the improvement from Fallout 4. I like that a lot. I thought that was really cool. But getting back to the VATS thing. Since I had never been able to play VATS and I had always played with power armor, I finally was able to build a full there. VATS build. Shit without power armor, you know, so it's all sneak and use vats and tons of criticals and critical banker and all this stuff. And oh my God, it was so much fun. And, and that's not here. And it's not that it's like super bad, but, but 
every enemy in this game is a bullet sponge and they just get more bullet spongy as you go. So when I think about games like like Far Cry 6, which is still ongoing on the channel. I mean, the gunplay in that game is superior by quite a ways. And it's not even a Call of Duty game, you know? Like, there are a lot of games that have taken gunplay kind of to the next level. So the gunplay in this game being what it is kind of surprised me. And the other thing that surprised me is... It's, again, space and the future, and it's 300 years in the future, and... I'm just surprised that there wasn't a little bit more in terms of weapons and weird things that weapons could do, and... I mean, these are the people who made Fallout, for crying out loud. Like... It, it feels like the Outer Worlds, and I've never put the Outer Worlds on my channel, but I really want to after this game is over. I want to go back into the Outer Worlds just to show the contrast. The Outer Worlds made by Obsidian is a little bit wacky enough and zany enough that it feels like it was made by a team of people who made Fallout. Now, it was because Obsidian made Fallout New Vegas. I'm looking for something here that's going to give me damage reduction because this is a protracted part of this fight here. So Obsidian makes Fallout New Vegas, and since it's the Fallout universe and it's got super mutants and it's got ghouls, it is a little wacky. And then they went and they made the Outer Worlds, and it's a little wacky because it's got things like a shriek ray gun, and it's got really kind of almost over-the-top characters sometimes, especially a couple of your companions. And it's got a really cool system where... I was a little annoyed at first by how your companions operate in that I, game, but I do like the fact that you can have two companions with you on every mission and they have unique skills that you can manually trigger. So as you can point at an enemy and say, die. do this special ability of yours to wipe them out. And I thought for sure that Bethesda would take that and incorporate that into Starfield. And they didn't. So it's just really strange to me. I mean, you have, you're still limited to one character. Okay, that's fine. Even though you got a starship that you're loading up with companions and you've got this thing constellation that you belong to and you would kind of anticipate that maybe you could take a couple of people with you. You can only take the one and they don't have anything special about them. Like, there's no special attack that I can tell Andresia to execute. She's got the grenade, which is nice. But one of the problems with her throwing these grenades is she so often throws them at herself and me. It's like, I like this, though. This is cool. This section is cool because it's this huge open area and lots of people shooting. And you got to be sort of cognizant of, of everything around you. I wish stealth worked better in this game though, which is really surprising that it doesn't because as another person pointed out, you know, stealth in Fallout 4 worked really well and if you put points into stealth, you could become nigh undetectable unless the enemies were right on top of you. But I like this because this is... <gasps> This is just a big open area with a lot of different kinds of cover. So having to move around and try to get behind the enemies and flank them and stuff like that. You can see a bullet hitting off the wall. It's, there's some good stuff here. This is probably one of my more favorite... Well, it's definitely one of my favorite missions in the game. It's the top... Three mission, maybe? Top four, top five, something like that. It will be interesting to see what mods can do. I know there's already a mod out that that improves some of the enemy AI because people have been really, really bagging on the enemy AI for doing things like trying to hide behind no cover and and not being as aggressive as they should and not using 
grenades as often as they should. And I do like that pistol. And of course, by now we've all seen the posts and the memes of people lockpicking things and there being nothing inside. That's. I feel a little bad now for in the in the first look and first impression video that I made of this of saying it's the least buggy Bethesda game I've ever played, and I don't think that's true anymore. I I didn't play Fallout 4 until eight months after it was released. I got it on sale and it was because it had equally mixed reviews when it came out and I thought the settlement building was going to be dumb so I didn't want to play it. How wrong I was. Settlement building's awesome in Fallout 4. And it ended up being an awesome game but I got to play it eight months later when there were mods and when the game had been patched a lot. So it was not a buggy experience for me Fallout 4. This, by the time I got to the end of this game, the first time playing through it, I had encountered a lot of bugs. <laughs> and, and opening containers to loot them and finding nothing was definitely high on the buggy list. We're looting everything, of course, because I don't mind playing encumbered. It's more important to have the loot. You want the money. Because you want to be able to save up and build your ship. The disappointment, of course, is New Game Plus. I don't I don't know how much time I want to spend talking about that. Maybe when we get towards the end of the game. There are some pretty cool powers later that will highlight, one of them will highlight living things, but I would really like to have one that would highlight turrets and robots too. That'd be kind of cool. Lots of stuff here, digipix, ammo, cash. Don't miss all of that. One of the other things that's kind of frustrating a little bit is, well, not a little bit, a lot. I cannot wait. The skill tree system. Another day, <gasps> another kill. And especially the way things level around here. Yeah, get this person. Still got one more running around. Zero wire is something you want. So, in previous Bethesda games, especially, I'm especially thinking about Fallout 4, but Skyrim certainly counts too. There's a certain pace of the leveling and the way that the systems are set up. For instance, Skyrim is all skills-based. So every time you use Literally. an ability, you're working to level it up. And after a certain amount of time, you can you can level it up, and then you can put another point into it, and you can grab something useful like the ability, you know, whatever ability you want to do. Cast more powerful spells, get more powerful attacks with your sword, whatever. The first cavalry was the greatest fighting force the Freestar Collective has ever seen. At the Battle of Nera, the 1st Cavalry was destroyed. Why? Because the generals got scared and asked for a truce. I've got no sympathy for cowards or for the people who put them in power. I've also got no sympathy for those who do their bidding. And this means you. So Fallout 4 is a perk-based system where you just poke points into your attributes and when your attributes are high enough and by attributes I mean like strength and perception and agility when your attributes are high enough you can poke points into specific perks like gun nut which allows you to make gun nut modifications and with this system they've tried to combine the two and what it's done is create this really frustrating experience where 
you have to do these little challenges in order to level up a specific skills and the really good skills are locked further down into the tree so when you leveled up in skyrim if you leveled up your sword for instance you leveled up your sword because you were using it so putting a point into a perk for the sword was something you wanted to do because you were using it it wasn't a wasted point same thing with fallout 4 if you were putting points into perception because you wanted to get a particular perk or you were putting points into luck or whatever because you wanted to get better sneak attacks and better criticals then you just put points into those things here you actually have to waste skill points by putting them into things that you don't care about just so that you can get to the lower the, or what we call higher tier level skills that you actually do want to use if you want to have a bigger crew on your ship You've got to poke 12 skill points into the social tree just so you can get to the last tier of the social tree so that you can actually get the ability to have a bigger crew. You're essentially wasting 12 skill points to get a part that you want. And it's maddening because like with Fallout, with Fallout 4 and the two DLCs, my character is routinely level 95, level 96 by the end of the game. So for me to get everything that I want to get, I can do that. Same thing with Skyrim. I can't remember what level my character is when I finish Skyrim, but I think it's around level 90. And that's with one DLC, I believe, in Skyrim. There's the whole Mirak thing on the, on the Morrowind Island. Here... I tried to stretch out my gameplay on my first run through it, and I still finished at level 40, which was not nearly enough to get any of the skills that I really wanted. I never got down to the later levels of jetpack so that you can get the really cool jetpack ability where up in the air, everything slows down. I never was able to get the bigger crew stuff. I was never able to get shipbuilding past level two, you know? so. This whole system, I would imagine modders might be able to rework it, rework the way the skill system work, and that would be a really cool mod to install, because I would like to just put points into the things that I want to use. Digi picking, however, is very awesome. I really like it. Down in the bottom left, you can see where it says auto slot and four. This kind of works like critical banking in Fallout 4. You can bank up to four of those auto slots. So on master level locks, if you have four of them banked, auto slot the first one and then the whole thing is pretty straightforward from that point on. As long as you know what the first one is that you have to put in, everything else you can deduce from there, from your remaining parts. Xeno Warfare Tech. Are we going to take that? My whole thing is if if I can remember that I have contraband on it because you got to go to Wolf later. But apparently, I don't take that. I really wish contraband and pirating worked so much different in this game. It's impossible to be a pirate in this game. The minute you attack a civilian vessel, you basically basically become wanted in such a way that it becomes impossible for you to either pay off your bounty or fight with the UC forever. I mean, you're going to get destroyed. Um, it feels like another one of those things where it feels like the bones are there, but really only the skeleton is there and there's nothing else. Like maybe, maybe they thought about it. Maybe Bethesda thought, oh yeah, people are going to want to be a space pirate in this game. We should set it up so they can do that. And then they never flushed it out. I would really like to see that change. Also, as somebody pointed out in another video, it's really disappointing that as a person with a bounty hunter background, you can't join the tracker sleep. I also wish to be prepared for There is all these different factions to join, situation, but you but can't actually join a faction related to this. To the one that has to do with the bounty hunter background. The, the bounty hunter background just feels really underutilized in the game. Like that could have been one of the coolest additions to the game 
and and it's just not fleshed out. I'm like, I want to see through the scope. <laughs> but this whole interior here is really cool. I like the way it's designed. Yeah, that was nice. Pull that person up. There's big open spaces to shoot and toss grenades and... And not a lot of cover in places like where we really don't have any cover here in this location. And I'm starting to get... Oh, how did that guy not get blown up by that? Healing would be good. Maybe they do. <laughs> so now it's time to move to go get this guy, and that of course puts you in danger for a whole bunch of other people. I'm pretty confident in my ability not to die here, but I'm not sure that's wise. Feels like we're gonna die. What the hell is going on here? Use another heal kit, buddy. I love this though. Here's one of the things that I really, really love about this particular mission and this particular uh, design here is look at all these mech bays and these partial mechs. So th this is a mech factory and they were building a lot of mechs here. So mechs were part of the original war between the Freestar Collective and whatever it is, the UC, the United Coalition, whatever they call themselves, United Colonies or something like that. Um, I love this. I love this history of it, how, how they had mechs and then they decided that they were too destructive and so they outlawed them. And it reminds me a lot of Frank Herbert's Dune book. And the reason is because in, people don't really know this if they don't read the book because the movies don't take any time to explain it. David Lynch's original film didn't really take any time to explain it unless you watch the three-hour extended version. And certainly Denis Villeneuve's new Dune movie hasn't taken any time to explain this. But in the world of Dune, it takes place in the year 10,191, which is 8,000 years from now. And in that time span, humanity had created AI and robots, and those robots served us and humanity became very decadent like robots did all the labor and we just kind of lounged around and ate drank mimosas well the robots of course being ai and sentient eventually uprose there was an uprising and there was a war and when it was all over humanity had managed to squeak out a win and determine that robots and in fact computers were a bad idea so like we have always done throughout history, because remember there's the Old Testament and then there's the New Testament of the Bible and then there's the Mormons adding on their own, tacking on their own thing to their own Bible. They're, so they, Mormons, believe it or not, they read the Bible and then they also read the Book of Mormon, but they read the Book of Mormon at like a 10 to one ratio of, of reading the, the Bible. But anyway, there's the Old Testament, New Testament, Mormons. The, in the Dune series, they augmented the Bible and they created another newer version of it called the Orange Catholic Bible. And in it, they created a new commandment. So then now, now there's 11 commandments. And the 11th commandment is man shall not create a machine in the image of man's mind, meaning no computers, no AI, no robots. Which is why in the, in the film, in David Lynch's film, and certainly in Denis' film, that's why there are characters called Mentats because their job is to be a human computer, to use the human brain to think, at, to be able to do calculations with the speed and precision that computers used to be able to do because they don't have computers anymore. And that's why like the interiors of the ships, you don't see huge computer panels anywhere because there are none, they're all manually controlled. Um, so it's really cool, the insides of the ornithropters and all that stuff, it's a really cool thing it showed how much frank herbert thought about these things while he was writing that book it's he said it took him seven years to write dune and a lot of that 
time is just spent thinking about these things. And he understood that that artificial <gasps> intelligence was a threat to humanity. And he assumed that if we were lucky enough to come out victorious, when there eventually was a conflict with it, that, that we would enact laws and rules that said, no, this is a bad idea. And so here we have Starfield where they made robots, which they made these giant mechs, which obviously are piloted by humans. It's not necessarily that they made robots or that there's AI, but they realized the One destructive the power of these mechs. mechs right and they the said, we can't have this. And so both the UC and the Freestar Collective outlawed them. Now, this leaves open they have anything of value? the possibility for a DLC later where maybe somebody goes rogue and decides that the best thing to do is build more mechs at one of these abandoned mech factories. I mean, look at that. It's really cool, some of this stuff. In fact, that would have been a cool thing to do with this particular storyline is to have this Paxton Hall character who really wants to go back to war with the UC to have him say, well, I've got this abandoned mech factory and screw the rules and the laws and the regulations. We're going to spin this back up and start making mechs. And then for him to attack Aquila City with these mechs, have them be outside the walls and you're trying to fend them off and stuff like that, because he's going to go take the council and kill everybody and perform a coup and take it over. That would have been really cool. And that would be a cool thing for a DLC in the future if somebody either on the UC side or the Freestar Collective side decided they wanted to start another war and they began it by going to a mech factory and firing it up and you actually had a chance to like fight mechs and pilot mechs and all that kind of stuff. That would be pretty damn awesome. But, you know, do we trust Bethesda to do anything like that? I don't. <laughs> I love how they have these side tunnels. So there's the main corridor, but then there's these side tunnels that get you to the same place and give you a chance to flank some enemies and stuff like that. I think that's really cool. The design of this particular dungeon is one of the two or three best parts of the whole game as far as, you know, combat encounters. You come here seeking justice? Well, what about justice for my soldiers? Minutes away, minutes from winning the battle and the war when the ceasefire order came down. Now there's a debt of honor and the people who betrayed us, the people of the Free Star Collective are going to pay. So he's very persistent about that. And I'm going to try to get some more damage reduction on myself before we run into the next area for the final showdown. As Bob Barker would say, the showcase showdown. And this is this is another one of the gripes that I have about the game is there's just like eight million pieces of aid. Really there should be one for each thing if you wanted to get really diverse about it. I mean what's wrong with just aid fixing everything? But okay, let's say you want to do it differently. What it feels like to me is that there should have been one piece of aid for each kind of affliction that you can get. So if you get frostbite, there should have been one kind of aid for that. But instead, there's like 12 different kinds of aid for six different kinds of affliction. And some of them are mixed and some of them aren't. And, place and then there's 8,000 different the kinds of pieces of both sides work. food that Not you can eat for in the galaxy needs to come with us, you know. nominal gain. You know, it's like, why? Why did they do it that way? And then there are so few weapons. So few weapon types. I'm going to crack the game here. It's an expert. So the first thing to do really with any of these is count and you can see there are six holes. So what we probably need to either you're either looking for a lock that's going to give you a four and a two or a three and a three. In this case, we have a four and a four and you're looking for a two that would potentially work at that angle for what's left. There's if you're going to do a three, you got to do a three and a three. So then it's a matter of, OK, we can rotate that. Is there a three that would fit? those other three slots and if we turn that around there is that's probably your entry point 
probably it would have been, you can get that faster again with the banking which is in the bottom right there you can see where it says auto slot and I may actually have to go backwards on this one I can't remember you can undo but it costs you digipix to undo so that's why I say if you've got them banked I think you earn the auto slots as you successfully complete these so I'm I'm of the mind that if you've got four of them banked and I don't start doing this until later later episodes but I'm of the mind that if you can auto slot four if you've got four of them banked just use the first one just use one and that'll usually set you down the path of okay by process of elimination you can figure out what the rest of them are so there you can kind of see what's going to happen there's this other third one over here if we flip it around it should take care of it i'm still trying to figure it out but i think it's that bottom right one there and then if you flip the other that bottom left one if you flip it around and put the single end on the right and that gets you that part and then you've got to get down to this last one which is a four and i think this the one right there in the middle that's it so now you're down to the last layer Which shouldn't be too difficult. It's what is it? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight. So you need a four and a four, really. To be able to do this. And there you go. And what do you get out of this? You get that. It's a hand loading suppressed calibrated pacifier epic shotgun. Which is not too bad. There it is, 120 physical damage. I like to have a shotgun for close encounters. Of course, remember Hicks from Aliens, James Cameron's Aliens movie. Pulls that shotgun out of his backpack. I like to keep that for close encounter. That is a great line. That is a great line in a great movie. So Andreja and I looting this. What is it? Why does she sound like a robot there? Did you need me Why to Why does she sound like she doesn't understand how speech works? It's just like Oh my gosh. It's just kind of crazy. Yeah, so there we go. There's a, another laser rifle is the Orion. It's a, it's a better version of the Equinox because it can basically fire two beams where the Equinox can only fire one. So it's worthwhile to give that to her, I think. And then oh. I have obviously picked yes, up a ton of stuff and we're going to favorite the Ash to Tamer, even though I don't really use it as much as I probably should. It's really nice to have it, but I need to actually use it more. So here we go. We can head on in here and defeat the first mercenary. And there's mostly just down here, so let's move on. So my first attempt in here went really bad. I died just because I was careless. There's a ton of enemies in it around here. The whole place is big giant square. There are turrets. And you can see I can't hit it. That pistol's nice. <laughs> that pistol is still rocking for me. You're dead! You hear me? There is Paxton Hole with the big big blue dot over him. So that's the problem of being in the middle is that people can come at you from different directions. But at the same time, it's a little more safe because around the exterior here, there are just too many people able to shoot at you. Uh, I'm going to die again if I'm not careful. But see, you're protected by a lot of windows, and the, the openings are very small. Wish that grenade would have gone off a little sooner. I love having that reticule, though. The 
Paxson's down. Now you just gotta finish off everybody else. It is impressive how much power the pistols have in this game. If you wanted to, I think it's completely possible to play a pistol build through the whole game and do pretty effective at it. Although, I'm not entirely sure about that at the very end of the game. Hopefully they amount to something. As I was saying earlier, they're pretty bullet spongy enemies and they get more bullet spongy right at the end. And fortunately, you can get access to an assault weapon that spits out a lot of rounds really, really fast. Got somebody off to my left shooting me there. Grenade in the air. She throws that up there, but then it plinks down. And I try to throw one up there, and it plinks down too. I just missed. Curse you. I don't know how those first three shots missed there, but she keeps trying to chuck him up there and they keep hitting that person's cover and falling down, so it's nice when you crit with that gun though. I'd love to have a little scope on that pistol. I may have to make a note of that. Scope that pistol. That would be a pretty good one. So once you get down far enough here, it seems like with the enemies, so there aren't so many left, then they all get little quest markers above them. Or maybe they were there from the beginning. It's just something that I don't, didn't notice until later on. Lots of looting, try to do it as you go. It's like cleaning the kitchen when you're cooking, you know? I don't know if any of y'all watch sports. I don't watch a lot of sports. I really only watch the NFL. So it's the only time I ever get to see commercials. And commercials can often be cultural touchstones. <laughs> or at least sometimes they can be funny. That's nice. Another really nice single shot hit there. And there's a commercial going around right now that's um, got... I can't remember if it's Geico or who it is. But they're, they're, they have like these play-by-play -play people watching over this family and the one guy says something like you know a lot of people clean while they cook but not these two <laughs> it reminds me so much because it was something my mother taught me if you clean while you cook it's so much easier i i can't believe it you just took on some of the best mercenaries in the freestar collective and Cut right through them. <clears throat> if we'd have had more like you in the war, we could have planted our flag in New Atlantis. Nah, no, it didn't want to hurt. The war ended a long time ago, buddy. Not the way it should have. Of course, I can't expect you to understand what we sacrificed, what we lost. You don't know what it's like to look around and see the faces of warriors who trusted you. <laughs> to lead them as they die screaming. I watched brave men and women torn limb from limb by monsters. I saw mech pilots cooked alive in their cockpits as their machines burned. <clears throat> Those deaths didn't have to be meaningless, but spineless leaders gave up on us even when victory was within our grasp. Do not assume you know what others have or have not experienced. And none of it gives you the right to take innocent lives. You don't know me. So don't preach to me about what I do or don't have the right to do. So this is really interesting. The voice actor is doing a really good job of portraying a character who's mortally wounded, right? I mean, he's struggling to breathe and everything. But the character is just standing up. Why is he not leaning against this thing at this wall on the left side, hand side why isn't he sitting on the ground there with his back up against it clutching his guts and looking like a character who really is mortally wounded it's just another example of, of Bethesda being complacent 
and lazy and not properly implementing this. Why didn't they motion capture all of this so that this guy's excellent performance matches the character? You really want to know? Because you might not like well, the answer. Well, I would like the answer to my question. Last chance, deputy. You can walk away right now and remain blissfully ignorant, thinking you fight for a noble cause. But if you still want the truth, <laughs> I'll shatter that illusion for you right now. I can handle whatever you have to say. <laughs> we'll see about that. Not long after I started the first, I was contacted by a man who said he represented someone wealthy and influential. <laughs> I refused to work for a shadow client, so we agreed to set up a meeting. Imagine my surprise when Ron Hope showed up. He offered me a lucrative contract to take possession of certain farms throughout Freestar space. And you saw a chance to get revenge on the Freestar Collective. The credits were good, but yeah, getting some payback was the real reward. <laughs> well, I'm bringing you in, buddy. Don't bother. Be ready for another fight. I'm gonna make this easy for you, deputy. I'm gonna die the way I lived. Weapon in hand, no compromise, no fear. But first, here, take this. Use it to cut out the weakness rotting at the heart of the Freestar Collective. When the next war comes, <laughs> and it will come, the Collective needs to be strong. Now my unit's waiting for me, and I'm gonna report for duty one last time. Goodbye, deputy. It's a little bit disappointing that he gets to be right back to full health. Now would be a gift. Could we talk? I mean, I just, I think it would have been so much more fulfilling and realistic if he's on the ground there clutching at his guts and he says, don't bother, and he tries to reach for his gun and you just smoke him, like, do it as a cutscene. I mean, that's one of those times where just doing it as a cutscene would be superior to doing what Bethesda decided to do here. It's, it's just part of the great puzzle of the whole game and why the hell did Bethesda do things the way they did it. So... We have to loot this whole place and it's getting beyond an hour so I think I'm going to trim out the rest of this video and we'll be on our way. I have been curious. I know that your role in Constellation was thrust upon you in an unusual way. But that experience does not demand that you stay. You could have delivered the artifact and then left. Why do you stay? Well, the artifact means something important that we find out what it does seem to be a unique situation with serious consequences that is what keeps me here as well my past is complicated and anyone in constellation will tell you i do not speak much of it but my family always stressed the importance of having a purpose in life you must have a reason for being mm. I think having goals is important. Hopefully you leave a little time for fun too. <laughs> fun is not yeah, a not consideration. I am not saying I am incapable of it. It just it should never be a priority oh, over yes, other things. When I first came to New Atlantis, I was shocked at how many people go about their business every day like drones. They do their jobs, eat their food, sleep in their beds. All seemingly without concern for because anything around Because they're programs. Them. Complacent. Their experience is so different from much of the settled systems. They do not know how good they have it. <laughs> Your experiences must have been very different than... Oh, that's the option I chose. Okay. You believe I am too quick to judge. 
Perhaps that is so. Purpose cuts through adversity. I know that all too well. And these people seem to have Again, no idea. Again, they're programs in a computer game. <laughs> I'm sorry life has been hard for you. I have? No. There have been times where I wondered whether it was worth it. My family is unique within the settled systems. I grew up outside the bounds of the United Colonies. Or That's the a big Star hint Collective. to her past. My parents and their parents before them did not believe anyone outside our family could be trusted. Because or you belong upon. to a cult. You can imagine, I am sure, how existence without ties to others is challenging in space. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Getting by on your own is admirable. Not a life I choose for myself, that's true. Choice had nothing to do with That's it. That's because you're born into me. it. But looking back, I understand their concern. For now, though, it would seem you and I have found purpose in Constellation. I believe that is enough. I am pleased that we have common cause and have enjoyed our time together. Thank you. And today's... Uh, now that I've actually finished the game on my first playthrough, um. I know Andresia's story. It was the one character in the game that I kind of liked, but not anymore. I don't know anything about Todd Howard as a person. I really don't. I know he's the head of Bethesda and that's it. But if this was the only game that I had ever played, then I would assume that Todd Howard was either a Mormon or that he belonged to the Church of Scientology. Because this game is full of cults. And cult people and religious inferences and churches where there doesn't need to be any. And religious overtones. And really, as a person who is an atheist and an ex-Mormon, I'm just... I, I feel like the word offended is overused, but it's just really chafes my sensibilities, I guess. I mean, he's got a church in the... He's got a group of people in the game that are supposed to be atheists, but they belong to a church. And then he's got a clear cult in the game who believe a whole bunch of nonsense. And... When they finally give you a character that maybe you just might want to hang on to through the game, you're thinking, well, she might be pretty cool. And she ends up being the Tom Cruise character. And she seems cool. She belongs to a cult. It just... God. Starfield is going to be one of those games where I'm going to spend all my time wishing I was on the development team so I could have pushed it in a different direction. So I just could have tweaked things. So I could have said, let's think about doing this instead. Like, Todd Howard really wanted this game to have a certain amount of realism with the NASA punk design of the starships and all this kind of stuff. And they decided not to go wacky like they have with Fallout 4 and not to go a little crazy like like the, the Outer Worlds by Obsidian. They wanted to be serious. And then they kind of sucked all the fun at out of the game. Glance, it seems we are the only ones to come through here. And at the same, same time, time, made it really religious and culty. Leave it to humans to find inventive new ways to kill each other. At least they realized these mechs were a step too uh, far. And the mechs could have been one of the coolest things. <laughs> I mean, it's just, the game is baffling. I really wanted to enjoy it. And I still want to enjoy it. I want to enjoy it in this playthrough, which is why I'm going to try to stick to doing the things that are the most fun in it as we work our way through the main quest because there are some fun bits in it. And this was one of the more fun ones. Captain, it is pleasant, pleasant to see you too, Vasco. <laughs> Any adventure you can fly away from. Is, is that how the saying goes? And Teresa reminds me a lot of Tristan from Pathfinder Kingmaker in that she's a character that I want to like, but her choices and background make me despise her. So, 
But there aren't a lot of good options for people to take with you. So that's the question. Who do you take with you? All right. Let's see what's out there. Sarah Morgan has a giant stick up her butt. Sam Coe is hokey. Barrett is the worst dad joke inflated ego of himself person of all time and Andresia is a cultist. Aim point reached. Orbit stable. I don't like any of these characters and the character that I'd actually want to take with me is still at the lodge. End of this episode, everybody. See you next time. As always, you know the deal. Leave questions and comments down below. Like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Until then, happy gaming, everyone.